It's a great pleasure for me today to introduce uh, Professor Emanuel Haber, a great information theorist, but a very good friend too. Emanuel uh, got his uh, bachelor degree in uh, math from APFL, and then he started an information theory project with Professor Emre Telatar. And it's then that he realized that information theory was his passion. So he went to MIT, got his PhD, and now since 2012, he's an assistant professor at Princeton University, jointly uh, with Depart the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering and Applied Math. Emmanuel has been also a recipient of several awards, among them the inaugural Bell Labs Prize 2014, the NSF Career Award, and the Google Research Award. Uh, and he all got this award thanks to his uh, work in bridging information theory and uh, community detection. Uh, bio network, social network offer a wide variety of community and today Emmanuel will tell us which are the fundamental limits in detecting such community in such network. So without further ado, please uh, uh, join me in uh, uh, welcoming, welcoming uh, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Antonia, for the introduction and the kind words. And uh, thank you, Marcus and Iraj, for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, truly a honor to be part of this workshop, uh, celebrating Shannon among many of the speakers who have been role models for me in my research. So I feel privileged, and I thank you for inviting me. So I want to tell you a bit about uh, how Shannon's uh, information theory and more generally its approach to solving problems has influenced me in not classical data transmission, but in data mining, so I'll start from the beginning. It was 1948, so I wasn't there back then, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that it was the communication era in full swing. Everybody understood that there will be a huge importance to the problem of transmitting information from a point to another, and probably everybody understood a very uh, basic principle, which is that the less noise there is in a communi communication media, the more throughput we should be able to achieve. But does this depend on the type of modulation, the type of communication media, or not, and how do we quantify this? And that's when Shannon came with a fundamental approach to this problem, which is, of course, simplified model, the discrete memorialized channel, but for which you could obtain a very complete characterization of when reliable communication is possible on the DMC, that a transmission is possible if and only if, and the key part here is that this is a necessary and sufficient condition, the rate of transmission is below some measure of the DMC parameters, which he called the mutual information. So now this was more than a theory, as it was said several times, it gave a benchmark for algorithms and generally the industry. This is a plot that I took from Bell Labs, in fact. So now, partly thanks to Shannon Bell Labs and to how we were good at transferring and storing information. We are at a different time now. Many people would call this the data era, where a huge amount of information is being transferred and stored worldwide and collected in, with new platforms, such as the social networks. And we all understand also a very general principle, which is that the more data, the more insight we should be able to get. But again, how do we quantify this? Are there any fundamental laws that we can come up with, like Shannon did for data transmission. So that's the goal of this lecture, and I'll first narrow it down a little bit more. The first observation is that a huge amount of information uh, provided through the data often comes as a network. So I'll give you here three examples, social networks. This is an example of a, a user's Facebook network. That's a call graph, collection of users in telephone network that are calling each other, and that gives an edge between them. That's a PPI networks, protein to protein interaction networks, connecting different proteins if they are doing some joint functionalities. And if the data doesn't come itself as a network, very often it can be organized as a network. It can be engineered as a network. So for example, images. An image is a collection of pixels. You can build the graph of pixels that connects the pixels if they are either close or of similar texture, similar color, which is used in segmentation of images. That's uh, uh, here, uh, biomedical medica uh, medical applications are huge patients that are connected by having similar profiles, or in this example here, it's disease that have similar gene expressions. 
and also here customer ratings. Books in Amazon that are connected if people rate them in a similar fashion. Or users that are, that are connected if they rate movies in a similar fashion. All right, so the problem is that rarely the data comes as you see in this picture. What you typically see is something that looks like that. Just a big cloud of dots that are connected with no apparent structure. So now, does anyone can mine some intelligent information from this graph? Okay, what if, yes. oh, David has seen something, <laughs> except David. So what if I reorganize that graph in this uh, fashion? Now, can anyone, anybody see some structure in this graph? <laughs> so of course I put the colors to further help, but even without the colors, this network, the way I built it, in fact, it's, this is not really that, that's the data that I uh, built with uh, MATLAB. It has five clusters, and the edge density within each cluster is 20 times larger than across the clusters. So now if this was a social network, or if this was patient in a hospital that are connected by similarity of profiles, then you would probably want to know if there are such groups that are hiding in your graph. So this is the basic problem of data clustering, but of course we only get to see this and if you try all possibilities, even if a genie tells you there are, there are five clusters in that graph, if you try all possibilities of partitioning the graph, then you will get most of the time this, use less information. And if you try them all, even after a billion of years, you'll still see this. So that's not an obvious problem. Uh, like in the talk of David, uh, the worst case counterpart of clustering the graph is NP-hard, but that's the goal of data clustering, extract meaningful cluster out of a graphical data to learn similarity in the class, uh, similarity classes in the data. And again, just to underline it once more, this is used a lot for customer profiling, so one of the first thing in the business uh, plan of Amazon and Google is to put you in the right cluster for recommendations and for advertisement. It's also, this is pretty much all unsupervised machine learning, not supervised but unsupervised, so image segmentations, that's using the graph of pixels and that you find the clusters for the segments, and genomics, medical diagnosis, like David's talk was all about graph too. Okay, so there's been a lot of work on this problem. There's been a huge amount of algorithms, but surprisingly, this question hasn't been quite studied so much. What is the fundamental limit of clustering? And that's of course the connection for us with Shannon. So here is the, the, the goal now in the next slide is can we Shannonize data clustering? So what do I mean by the Shannonization? So of course there's a few points that were already mentioned throughout the, the workshop. The first one is get a good toy model. That's what Bob Geiger said yesterday, simplify the problem. For in the case of communication, this was a discrete memory channel in the paper of Shannon. The second, part is derive the fundamental limit without focusing upfront on the efficiency of algorithm. <laughs> Using the information that there is in the graph, when can you recover those communities? So in the case of Shannon, this became the channel capacity, this fundamental limit. And now the third point is now that we have a target, which we didn't have before, can we achieve that target with efficient algorithm? Which of course in data transmission was far from an easy task and took a lot of years but eventually got resolved. And then, as Geiger said yesterday, you can add layers, generalize, and iterate that process. Okay, so let's try to do shanization of data clustering, starting with a get a good toy model. So luckily, there was a good toy model in this literature, in the uh, data clustering literature. It's called the stochastic block model, SBM, so that's our new DMC. And I'm gonna define it to you on an example the starting example we had. So the parameters in the SBM are N, P, and W. A little bit like in the DMC, there's N, which is the number of channel used, P, which is the input distribution, and W is what you, the priority switch is. So here we have N, the number of nodes in the graph. So in this picture, there's a thousand nodes. We have P, which is a probability vector whose dimension K is the number of clusters you have in your graph. So here in this picture, there's five clusters, K is five, and PI is the relative size of community I. So this vector tells you the size of the communities and since they all have the same size in this picture, they all, they all have relative size one over five. 
And finally, you have that third parameter, the W matrix, which is here. And that's a K by K matrix. And Wij is a probability that a node in cluster I and cluster J connects. Okay, so in this example again, there's only two parameters. Everybody inside the cluster, every pair inside clusters connects with probability one over 50. And every pair across clusters connect with probability one over 1,000. Now, let's say that to simplify, you know the model parameters, you know the DMC. You generate a random graph under this model, like, like I did here. And now you shuffle this graph randomly, remove the colors. I give this to you and ask you, can you recover the clusters? And like in Shannon setting, we're gonna ask a recovery which is probabilistic. We want to succeed with a failure that goes to zero. And this is a definition, data clustering, we're gonna say is solved if there exists an algorithm, C hat, that reconstructs the clusters, or if you wish, that labels the node with a color, so that the coloring C hat is the true coloring with a probability of error that has to be vanishing as the number of nodes tends to infinity. So that would be the block error probability, if you wish. Okay, so that's our toy model. We have our, band, we have our problem. And now we'd like to understand, is there a fundamental limit? So maybe we can first start with a simple example. Imagine in your graph, I should have given you that on the, on the picture, but if, I hope you can remember the picture that I had there on the right. If you connect inside the cluster with probability one, every pair of nodes, and if you connect across cluster with probability zero, then you agree with me that this should be a trivial problem. You just see five clusters that are detached. So it should be trivial to reconstruct them. If you connect with the same probability inside the cluster than across the clusters, then you probably agree with me that this is impossible to solve. There's no trace of the clusters in the graph. So there's no hope to reconstruct anything. So the question is gonna be how close these parameters can be, depending on how expressive the community, the difference of connectivity from being inside a community to the other is, it should be sometimes possible or not to solve the problem, and is there a fundamental limit? So before finding the fundamental limit, we need to find what is the right regime where we could chase that fundamental limit. So Shannon told us that we can communicate with code books of exponential size. So what would be here the right regime where some transition may happen? And it turns out that if you take your W matrix to scale like log n by n times a constant matrix Q. So what this means is that every node in the graph has a number of friends, a degree, which grows, which grows logarithmically. So that's, first of all, okay, why is that the right regime? You can only know once you solve the problem. But the, the interesting aspect here is that not only this is where the transition will happen, where the capacity happens, but it also happens to be a relevant uh, regime for applications because most networks are sparse, either with a very large degree or a constant or a logarithmic but they will rarely be very dense. So you don't want the degree to be growing like the number of nodes, you want it to be much smaller like logarithmic. So now, if you take a node in community I, and you ask how many neighbors does it, ha does it have in cluster J, with these parameters, you will have exactly, as I said, logarithmic growing numbers with this constant. And as you can see, this depends on, of course, where you are, I, and where you go, J. So here is a node in community one. It has some neighbors in each of the other communities. Let's call this its community profile. If you take a node in community four, now I, this is gonna move here, then its community profile is going to be different. And this depends on the parameters of the model that are multiplying in here. So this is a bit like the channel problem. The different outputs would have different distributions. And can we say, understand what is the mathematical metric that would allow us to measure differences in those parameters and that would translate into being able to extract the clusters in the graph? So I'll, I'll tell you now what is the answer looking like. So yes, there is a clustering capacity. So we, we obtained this in two consecutive papers. The first paper, we did this with Afonso Bandera and Georgina Hall, who were students at Princeton. And we only did the case with two communities. This was published in the Information Theory Transactions. And then uh, the next year with uh, my other student, Colin Senden, we did the case, the general case that I'm describing you here. And this was published in Fox, the Foundation of Computer Science Conference. So the result read as follows. Data clustering in an SBM is possible if and only if some function of the parameters of the model is above one. So what is the function? I'll give you what it looks like. This is the function. It takes a mixture of the parameters according to some summation. T is between zero and one. So it's some formula. 
it would take much more time to explain you where the formula comes from. So inside, instead of spending time on it, I'll tell you just two things. The first thing I will tell you is that, interestingly, you can express that functional as an F divergence. So if you are an information theorist, you definitely know what an F di divergence is, so probably most people here will know that. But there's another F divergence, which is a relative entropy, or the KL divergence, that is the one that Shannon used to characterize the fundamental limit of data transmission. So F divergence Cs seem to be, for some reason, closely related to fundamental limits. At least we have two concrete examples, probably more. I also want to stress again the analogy with Shannon's theorem, who says that data that transmission in a DMC is possible if and only if the rate is below the mutual information. Of course, P and Q are different here. P is the input distribution here that should be taken to be the maximal, to maximize the mutual information, and Q is the channel in this case, but the analogy, I think, is pretty striking. Of course, we don't have a rate in our problem because the, ch the network, the data we observe, I'm assuming is whatever you see. If now you come up with a, a model where you also have a rate of measurement for your data, then you will have a rate also there. So this is like a, it's as if you, you do tra data transmission at a fixed rate and you ask can you support or not reliable communication, so. Okay, so now the, the last part. We have our fundamental limit, we have our benchmark, the target, can we achieve it efficiently? Can we do the coding theory for clustering? So the answer is uh, yes, uh, good news. We, we have an algorithm, it's in the same paper with Colin Senden in the last slides. And the algorithm is, has in fact quasi-linear time complexity and it achieves a limit. So here I put the plot which kind of resembles the very first plot on the first slide uh, from the Bell Labs curve. What this is is Q11, Q, I assume these are the two when I took two communities and this will be the region which is infeasible from the theorem uh, J functions and this will be where you can succeed and in fact the algorithm can succeed in the entire region. It's also nice to see what the literature was doing because as I said, there's a huge amount of literature, a very uh, diverse type of algorithm. In fact, most of these papers would come say, I want to use this specific algorithm and I'll see what it does. This is the type of equations they were getting with different powers. I believe none of them get to the threshold, but the best one which gets very close to the threshold is Max Schrute 2001. So it also allows us to benchmark the algorithm, the limit. Okay, so now, the, of course, the, perhaps uh, one of the critical questions, same as uh, what David had in his talk. This is a great theory, perhaps. It gives you a new algorithm. We, ha we have our new algorithm that we develop based on achieving the threshold, which we hope is a good algorithm. And the question is, does it work on real data? And the answer is no, it fails terribly. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's not true, it's a, it's a joke. <laughs> So let's see what it does on real data. So here is now, this is no longer a graph that I did on my laptop, that's real data graph. The picture is done on my laptop, but the data comes from a paper of Adamich and all in 2005. This is the following. In the 2004 political election, someone took most of the blogs that were on the platform of the different parts and just computed a graph where he connected two blogs if they refer to each other. So if I write a blog and I put a link on someone else's blog, it doesn't matter the direction, then there will be an edge between the two blogs. All right, so we took that data set, this graph of blogs to connecting to each other in the political election, and we said, let's see if there's some structure hiding in that network. So we applied the algorithm we developed to achieve the limit, and this is what we got. We got that there are two clusters. And does anybody have a guess on what these clusters are? <laughs> Right, so these are Republican and Democrats blogs. And in fact, the good thing is the data set of Adamich tells you which blogs are which. So we could go and check. And what we obtain is that we get 96% reconstruction on whether a blog is, polit is Republican or Democrats without having any information about the blogs, just which refers to which. So again, now the hope is that instead of doing this on the blog network, maybe we'd like to do this on the patients in the hospital on the genes uh, in the genetic networks, on proteins talking to each other to see which ones seem to work for, together. So now there's a student here, uh, Camille, who's doing basically her entire uh, uh, project just to apply the algorithm on many data, data sets, the algorithm we developed. Also, to compare 
The new thing we have with the Shannon picture is that now we can tell, according to the model that we calibrated on its data, the block model that we fit on the data, its mutual information with the J function is 1.8, which is above the one limit. So if you believe that this was a good model for the data, at least you are consistent the, with the fact that you should be able to recover the clusters, which is some sort of certificate that you obtain if un assuming the model was correct, which is never true, but it might be good enough to approximate the reality. And again, just the last part is the comparison with other methods. These are two spectral methods with Laplacians. That's our, our, the algorithm we developed. We call it acyclic, acyclic belief propagation because it's a modification of belief propagation that handles cycles. And as you can see, it does better than the Laplacians and Edison symmetries. Okay, so I want to add, that's my, that's my last uh, slide, but I think it's an important slide and somehow it's, a, it's not a positive note about Shannon, so it's like a worry, a concern, and surprisingly it's not been mentioned at all so far in this workshop, but I think it's a very important point. Can Shannonization be misleading? So what do I mean by that? Well, the three points in Shannonization, as I described, get a good toy model, derive the phenomenon limit without worrying about the complexity, and then try to achieve it with algorithm. Turns out that Shannon's either genius or luck was that the fundamental limit in data transmission could be achieved efficiently. After maybe 60 years, but it, it was solved. Turns out that in the example I talked to you about here, we, could, we were able to find algorithms that also achieved the data clustering limits. But this doesn't have to be always the, the rule. It may not be always possible to come up with efficient algorithm that will achieve the limit that has been derived without caring about complexity. And in fact, there's something much more concrete here. Is that if you consider what I call the rate distortion analog of clustering, which is you don't want to reconstruct exactly the cluster, but let's say you just want to get 70% of the node correct. So that's a, like a reconstruction with distortion. In that context, physicists have come up with a conjecture in 2011 based on non-rigorous arguments, but yet very precise that for this partial recovery problem, starting from five clusters, so up to four, there's a single transition, and you can achieve it with efficient algorithm, but starting at five clusters, they predict that there is a gap between what you can do efficiently and information theoretically. Well, it turns out that we just proved not exactly the conjecture, which would rely PNP type of argument, so it's gonna be far from reach, but we proved the following, that the physicists told us what they think the computational threshold is, like the limit for, computation, for efficient algorithm. It's called the k stegum -Stig threshold. We first came up with an algorithm that achieves that threshold, which was unknown. So we said, yes, in fact, you can achieve this k stegum threshold. And then we've proved that, in fact, at five communities, you can cross that threshold with information theory. Using typicality arguments, you can go below that threshold. And in fact, what we prove in that paper is that the gap between what you can do with information theory and computationally efficient methods in this KS threshold is growing and becoming very large with the number of communities growing. So there's two possibilities at this point. Number one is that we are not smart enough with the algorithm we can develop. For example, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that in the 70s, coding theorists were thinking that the cutoff rate was the fundamental limit for efficient algorithm for some period of time. And then they were proved wrong lately when we realized that you could go beyond the cutoff rate. So maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe the physicist's prediction is wrong. Maybe that Kest and Stingum bound is not the actual threshold for efficient algorithm and we will eventually cross it. Or information theory is loose. In other words, it's still gonna be a very useful thing to derive and we will want to derive because it's gonna tell us what we can never reach. And in fact, if we cannot understand the information theoretic threshold, then there's no hope to understand the computational threshold because we are adding the complexity constraint, but it may not give us the right targets for algorithms that are efficient, unless P is equal to NP, which is doubtful, or unless maybe quantum computer one day are becoming uh, the standards. So I think that's very interesting because it gives us a challenge. And uh, I'll, leave, I'll conclude with this note is that Perhaps for data mining problem and for machine learning problem, we'll have to worry a bit more about the interaction between information and computational theory. All right, thank you very much. These are my students. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for the great talk. There are, uh, we have, I think, uh, time for one or two questions. 
Yes. So, you know, a biologist, uh, and they're, they can be tricky, would, imme would immediately ask me or tell you we don't know the number of clusters. Before. Right. Our clusters yeah. may be overlapping because right. parts may be shared by two communities. Yeah. There's a fuzzy boundary between right. communities. And computer scientists have worked on the agnostic side of that problem, but the right. algorithms are not scaling well, and belief yeah. propagation algorithms scale well. Right. Is there any hope that your algorithm could be used with no knowledge of the number of clusters? Can it be adapted? Would you think in that direction? Okay, so a few positive comments and then one negative. Positive, we have a paper in NIPS a few months ago where we solved the problem of uh, finding the number of clusters without imposing it. As long as you assume the model comes from an SBM and you, don't, you assume that the number of clusters is fixed, then you can learn it from the graph. You can learn, you can learn the clusters. No, no, there, 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 wasn't, there wasn't much to prove that you can learn the parameters. There's, those are the heuristics. Uh, this, the second point, overlapping communities, that's a hard one. And the, clear, the natural generalization here, and that's where I think the generalization of the toy model comes in, is that you can start by quantizing, say, so what is an overlapping community? It's instead of being zero or one, I am 20% red, 80% blue. So basically you have a real number. So you can have a model that generalizes what I said here with real valued labels. And you can start by quantizing it to get the first insight. So that's, that's a path that is being developed. It's not obvious, but I think eventually we're gonna understand overlapping communities. ABP, uh, belief propagation scales well, but uh, of course some of these real data are millions of points, so you, you really have to be careful. So we, we run our algorithm, ABP, on three, four hundred thousands of nodes on laptops. So that's, that's already significant, but it's not uh, a several billion, uh, millions of nodes or more. Okay, let's, let's uh, thank you. Thank you.